Good evening, students of British and American culture. Uh, this is week 11, and we're doing a lecture on the American century. This is the second one. Uh, we were doing three because uh, the lectures got longer and longer, but uh, now we've uh, shrunk it down to two again. I apologize for the first part being so long, but uh, that was one of the most important lectures this semester, so it, it uh, did take longer to get through. Now, we are at the midpoint, we're past the midpoint of the semester, but we didn't have a midterm exam. Um, there, there has been an opportunity for people to give feedback, uh, both positive and negative. And as usual, one of the main criticisms for this class is there's too much information. And uh, I'm well aware of that. That's, um, it's hard to get around that. It, it's uh, British and American culture, the, the, the class itself should be divided into sections. I try to cover everything uh, lightly, but in, I, I can't, I have to go into some more detail. And uh, the class has sort of ballooned a little bit. So that is a valid criticism, and I understand that you might be overwhelmed by the amount of information. Um, I think it's important information. I think all this stuff is, I wish I could tell you more, but I understand that you're overwhelmed, especially if you're a freshman, about the amount of things I'm trying to tell you. But as I've said all along, really what you need to do is focus on the main points that I emphasize. I, I fill in everything with all the information in the textbook and the website, so I know you haven't had a test, so you're concerned. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put together sort of like a study guide. I'm not going to summarize the whole class for you because I don't have time, uh, but I'm going to make a list of concepts, just like I've done here. And um, I'm going to upload it onto the website two weeks before the exam. So you can say, okay, I need to know about the, the Celtics, the Romans, uh, the Anglo-Saxons, the Danes, the Normans, uh, then I need to know about the Black Death, and I need to know about William Shakespeare, and I need to know about Henry VIII. I'm going to make a list. It's going to be a long list, but I, I'm going to make this file, and um, it'll be a list of names, uh, events, and ideas that if you do the research and you study those things, then you will be prepared for the exam. So you're not wondering, you know, um, what... Professor Sullivan is going to ask me on the exam. I, I'm going to give you sort of a short list of all the things that we've talked about this semester. So you will not be so concerned about, uh, you know, searching for different things in page 115 of the textbook or something. Just so you understand, I haven't tested you, so you don't realize that I'm not going to look for something, a small detail that I, I wrote on a certain page or where that's buried in the website or in a slide uh, and, and ask that and, and that that's going to cost you your grade. Trust me, what I want you to know are the major ideas of this class. I, I'm, not a, a vindictive, I'm not a vindictive person. I, I'm not here to try and uh, punish students. So I think some students are concerned about that. Korean students especially are always concerned about their grades um, because you're very competitive and that's how you've been raised. But what I want you to understand is the class. I want you to understand the concepts. And I don't want you to walk away from the class having memorized a million things and forgetting all of them. That's not the point. Secondly, <clears throat> some students said, well, this is too difficult for a freshman. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid you're wrong about that. Last semester, the student that had the highest score in the class uh, was a freshman, and she her she only got one mark off. Uh, she she had a perfect midterm. She only had one mark off on the six quizzes, and only a few marks off on the exam. She finished with a ninety nine percent in the class. <clears throat> that was a freshman. She had the best score out of uh, 85 students in the class. So, no excuses, freshmen. This is university. It's a challenging class. I want it to be challenging. I don't want to uh, make this class too easy. So this is a challenge. It is in English. 
not in your native language, most of you, although I've had students from, uh, I've had un uh, American students before, and I've had students from English-speaking countries, and they have not had the highest score. So, uh, you know, that just goes to show that uh, if you study hard, it's not about your English ability, it's about your ability to understand and, and to communicate uh, ideas about culture. So, um, that's the way it is. This is a challenging course. There's a lot of material. I'll make it as manageable as I can. I'll give you a short list for concepts, ideas, people, events to study. And um, since you haven't written any quiz, uh, any quizzes, I have all my quizzes for the last five years of teaching or so. And um, I'm going to upload a few of the old quizzes just so you can look at them. Uh, I'm not saying none of the questions are going to be on the exam. They're just quizzes from previous years. I'll just choose a few random ones uh, just so you can have a look at what the multiple choice questions will be like. Uh, and that should help you prepare. And I think that's fair. That's all I can do. Um, again, we are stuck not being able to meet each other in person. So uh, this class is being done a little bit differently, but I'll do the best I can to um, consider your needs. And um, as usual, uh, respond uh, with some, some ways to uh, encourage you and uh, instruct you and, um, and support you in, in before you do the exam, because the exam is going to be a big deal um, because we haven't had the midterm. <clears throat> okay, so uh, that's all fine. That's all good news uh, for, for both of us, I think. The feedback is always welcome, and um, if I can make adjustments, I do. So today, this lecture will be a little bit shorter than usual, I hope. Um, no promises, though. You know I lied to you before. So the American century, we talked about it. There's three major periods, according to the concept that I introduced to you uh, by Mr. Hodgson, Professor Hodgson. Um, there was uh, an early optimism period, and then a crisis, and then a middle period, and a crisis, and then a late period, which we're still sort of, we're probably coming out of that um, third period now, but we'll just stick to the, you know, whole idea that, that we're at the end of the 20th century now, even though we're well into the 21st. All of these things really apply, so um, we, you, I think you'll, you'll find that all of these things are quite familiar. So I'm just going to go through these, you know, five ideas, just like I did for the 19th century when I started talking about Americanism in the, it was 18th century and 19th century, but um, when I introduced uh, American culture um, halfway through the class, I threw those five concepts out at you, which sort of um, um, show what American, if there's sort of elements of American culture, which still persist, but especially when America was new at the end of the 18th and the early 19th century. And um, you did your assignment, your graded assignment, which most people handed in. Um, if you haven't handed in, you can still hand it in late, but uh, most people handed in, uh, you know, a paper on one of those five. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to talk about five new things that um, are also a big part of uh, America, but in this sense, I'm like I said, America in the 18th century especially was more of an insular country that was inward focusing. So all of those ideas were concerned about, you know, domestic life and what Americans would do with themselves. But I, I would like to suggest that the, this Americanization really is, it, it is a domestic process where people come in and people immigrate into the United States and they become Americanized which is, that's the original process of Americanization, is becoming American, uh, because, mo you know, very few Americans are actually from the, the continent originally. So you have, everybody who arrives uh, to a lesser or greater degree has to become American culturally, right? But um, as America became more powerful and rose in status and, and uh, became more involved in world politics in the international community, what American culture started doing, instead of absorbing people from other cultures into America, America became famous, became reputable and um, admired and, and uh, imitated. Uh, so that there was, 
there was other countries that were trying to do things the American way, the same way that other countries tried to do it the Spanish way, or the, the French way, or the Chinese way. Like the, these uh, great civilizations who did things, who, who, uh, which other cultures and other countries looked at and, and emulated and thought, admired, and wanted to um, you know, appropriate for their own cultures. We, we always go on and on you know, about Greek culture and Roman culture uh, in the, as the basis of Western culture. You know, and, but I've read some fascinating books. Roman culture derives a lot of its influence from Greek culture. And so that's, well, that's still you know, Western, but not really. It's Eastern Europe, or Southeastern Europe, but almost on the border of Asia, getting close there. But the Greeks did a huge amount of imitating of the Middle East and of Egypt in particular, you know, those civilizations predated Greece and India. India had a, a great civilization long before the Greeks did. So everything you saw, you know, the Greeks had their own, developed their own culture and their own uniqueness, but a lot of it had been derived, appropriated, imitated from the great civilizations that they respected, the Egyptian, uh, the Mesopotamian, and the Indian, right? So America, likewise, you know, they, uh, they admired the European cultures, they imitated the French, they imitated the British, of course, because that was their parent country. Um, they imitated, in some ways, they imitated Germany or Rome. But in the 20th century, they started to develop their own characteristics that because of their position and power in the world, which we talked about two weeks ago, they won World War II, not single-handedly, Russia basically defeated the Germans almost single-handedly, not single-handedly, but if you're going to choose somebody who defeated the Germans, it was the Russians. But basically, the United States defeated Imperial Japan, uh, and they fought against the Italians and the Germans. So they, they fought against everybody, and they won, and they became this, this superpower, and it, it seemed to fulfill you know, the, five, the manifest destiny and the belief system, all those things that were fundamental ideas of, of the American culture started to just, just as in the Depression, it looked like everything was falling apart. Everything recovered, and then America took its rightful place at the top, you know, as the, the most powerful uh, state in the world. Okay? So this is the sort of, this is the sort of mindset that, that uh, became common in the middle of the 20th century was that the United States was uh, the most important, most significant, most powerful, most influential um, country in the world and that they were doing everything right. Okay? And to a certain extent, even though it's clearly, it was never true, but that America has done many things right, that we still have this you know, after effects of that mid-century ascension of the American culture that we're having trouble letting go of, right? That right now even <clears throat> America is doing a horrible, horrible job of the coronavirus. By far the worst situation in the world. Uh, they have a leader who is incompetent and the whole thing has been a uh, complete disaster. But people are still willing to it, somehow uh, view America as the, you know, the, still the best country, as a premier country, as a, as a country that, that we can rely upon. That, that, that even though they're doing everything wrong with the coronavirus, that America is still in every other sense, or even in that sense, we don't really want to believe that they're doing it so badly. It's, it is unbelievable to me that the, the amount of, the number of people that have died in the United States is, is three times more than the next highest country in the world. Uh, it's, it's just, um, people are in disbelief. And that's because I think the world has been, to a certain extent, Americanized. And everybody looks towards America as an example uh, of a culture that has, has, is successful. And um, we need to reevaluate that. But let's just talk about uh, how this works, right? So th this is what we call Americanization. Canada is extremely Americanized. We couldn't help it. 
uh, economically, socially, politically, any way you can think about it. Fashion-wise, uh, you look around, you, when I came to Korea, everybody thought I was American. Uh, there's no way really to distinguish between Americans and Canadians. Even by accent, it's pretty hard because uh, North, you know, people who live in the United States that live near Canada have a similar accent anyway. So there's really um, not a clear way of, of delineating between a Canadian and American, even politically, we have our conservatives and our liberals and our moderates and everything else. Um, so we identify as Canadian, but uh, culturally there's, there's very uh, small differences between us. And uh, this is because the process of Americanization um, started even before Canada existed. Because when, the, um, when America won, when the, the colonials defeated the British Empire, and created the United States, as I told you, uh, a large group of loyalists who didn't want to re remain in the new, newly formed United States but wanted to be British citizens moved to Canada. So Canada immediately got an influx of British colonials from America and essentially was Americanized right there. And that's like the foundation of, of Canada is half French, half American, if you want to look at it that way. So this is what Americanization is. It's the way that Americans are. It's American culture, American lifestyle, uh, the things that are American, and uh, it's uh, the spread of that around the world. And because America became so powerful, and they're, you know, they became outward looking, and they became involved all around the world, and they brought their military, and they brought their politics, and they, their people traveled everywhere, and they made uh, economic connections and, and political connections with everybody all over the world, because they became that, you know, um, they, they became that type of, of state to interact across the world and spread uh, itself, and because all of many countries desired whether they, well, not desired, whether they desired to or not, many countries had to interact with the United States, it became the focal point for this exchange of, of culture. And lots of things came into America too, but more than ever, it was projected. So what was projected? Well, this is an evolution thing. This is not a revolution thing. So uh, America was the first modern democracy where they created a republic where after they had the Revolutionary War. They had the Revolutionary War and uh, defeated the British. So you can see um, when that happened in 1776 and then when they won the war in 1783 and George Washington became the first president, um, they, they were a unique form of government then. But now the number of republics and constitutional monarchies and democracies across the world is there, there everywhere. Um, but America was, you know, the, uh, the leading edge of that. And their participation, you know, of course, in multiple wars, especially the ones we talked about last week and the week before, their participation in the world wars um, spread that. They, they defeated the dictatorships and the, uh, the regimes uh, of Italy and Germany, and now that those states have transformed themselves into democratic states. So one of the things that is a mark of, in Korea too, um, and, and other countries all around the world, directly or indirectly, that they spread democracy. This is sort of an anti-communist thing too, um, but um, fundamentally what they were trying to do is, is spread this idea of uh, some sort of representative government. And so that's a fundamental aspect of Americanization. Capitalism, again, as opposed to communism, where there's no property, that um, there would be a competitive market that would, the government would largely let um, operate on, it, on, its, on its own without interference, um, that things would have uh, a free market would dictate prices and that uh, competition is a, is a positive thing for companies, corporations and individuals. And um, because again, because of the conflicts in the 20th century and how things resulted uh, with America and the West largely coming, um, achieving victory, that their systems um, were imitated, copied, 
uh, spread and utilized by other countries. And so capitalism is another mark of uh, the uh, Americanization that uh, spread around the world. Consumerism is something that Americans have always, you know, from the very beginning, uh, they hated taxes and they loved uh, shopping. And not shopping the way you think of it now, but just, just get good, like producing things and exchanging things. And I mean, that was a large part. Puritan, the Puritan mindset was work hard and sustain yourself. But, you know, when America, by the time the United States became a country, by the time George Washington was the president, um, you could, there was um, this supply and demand, this, um, and especially demand. They, I mean, one of the things that, that caused the Revolutionary War was the fact they didn't want to pay taxes on their sugar or their tea or, or their, their documents and their paper. It's because they used those things a lot, um, at the time more than other people. But, um, you know, as recently, it's probably still true, but some, some countries are exceeding the United States now, but in, in terms of per person, how much energy uh, and how many goods, products, material, space that an individual uses, the United States was way ahead in the 20th century of any other people on Earth. They, they demanded a lot. And after World War II, that is one of the things that drove, you know, the incredible growth of the American economy was everybody wanted a house and everybody wanted a, a washer and dryer, a refrigerator and two cars. And you needed to produce that and you need to exchange goods uh, and you need to get a job and you need to sustain your family, you need to borrow money. And this just drove things even, even faster forward. So that's this, um, and now we're, you know, it's not the only way of doing things. It's just the way we have been doing things that we are um, a, a, a society in Korea too, because Korea has largely followed the United States model, the American model, that um, consumption uh, is the main driver of, of, of the economy and that um, without consumption, the economy would die. That's not necessarily true, but um, you can see that Koreans love stuff and Americans love stuff. And you can see it doesn't matter if it's fast food or it's technology or, it's, you know, it's cars, uh, luxury items, clothing, more is better. Newer, more is better. And this is what consumerism represents. And lots of people reject that, but overall that is a, that is a sort of, um, that is in the, an element of the, uh, the American lifestyle that not only is it what they do, but it's also what you see when you see it in, we're going to talk about Hollywood next week and pop culture. And, and that's what you see Americans doing. When you see Americans on TV or, or on, in the movies, you see them doing that stuff. And so you assume all of them do. And many of them do. Not all of them, but it is, there is, that is part of American culture, for sure. And uh, other cultures have become, what can you say, addicted or, addicted is a good word, <clears throat> to consumerism. Okay, and then communication. Now, the Postal Service in the United States uh, has always been, um, famous, and it continues to, the private system and the government system, um, originally there was a practical and, and uh, it was a necessity in the beginning because, um, again, because of military um, situations, because when they were fighting the British, that they, they needed to communicate with different parts of the country in order to coordinate and so on. But then uh, for business and, and for defense and for security and for politics, um, not just for pleasure or entertainment or anything like that, but it, it was something, a communication network needed to develop because America is such a big place. So, you know, the, the technology goes along with the communication thing, but Americans have always tried to communicate with each other um, to maintain communication with each other and to improve communication with each other. And the technology uh, came along because of that, um, because that was sort of a necessity, not because it was just a desire. The, the telegraph and the telephone 
and then you know the television and the computer and the internet and so on these these things brought Americans closer and closer together because Americans were uh, I think they I believe they still are uh, the most mobile people on the planet they don't necessarily leave their country but they don't have to because their country is so large so communication involves transportation it, it involves devices and in so it's the movement of people and it's the the actual communication which we have now um, through technology which brings me because it's sort of connected to the last of the five points about Americanization is that uh, America has brought technology around the world <clears throat> initially in many cases it was military technology and sometimes that technology was given shared or sold uh, two groups of people in order to fight against other people. For example, during the Cold War, um, lots of material, technology, equipment, uh, weapons were sold or, or given or lent um, to groups of people that would fight um, supporters of the Russians. Um, these wars were called proxy wars because the Russians and the Americans didn't uh, actually, their militaries didn't directly fight each other. So. For example, in Vietnam, you know, the Americans would fight against the North Vietnamese uh, and the South Vietnamese would fight with the Americans and the Americans would supply them with the equipment and training and technology, radios and backpacks and equipment and all that kind of stuff. And the Russians and the Chinese would help the North Vietnamese. Um, and so in so doing, they, they sort of spread technology all over, the, all, all over the place. This drive for technology um, often has a military application first, but the thing that the United States is good at, um, of course they're good at developing it for the military purpose because their military is, as everyone knows, um, the most powerful military in the world and has been for about a hundred years. But it's, it's also that ability to take a technology that uh, was developed for a military application uh, as, as defense or as a, as a as a weapon and then turn it into something uh, that can serve the public. Um, the internet is a great example, the computer is another example, the radio is another example. To use, to allow uh, soldiers and military um, units to communicate with each other and then to allow people in, in, you know, to allow citizens to communicate with each other for completely different purposes. Uh, probably, you know, for trade, um, for entertainment, uh, for, for education, and all kinds of things. And uh, so this drive towards technology, sometimes it was the other way around. Sometimes the technology was uh, developed for, you know, by a citizen and developed for uh, more of, a, you know, uh, a, a more innocuous pro uh, purpose, something that was not necessarily... Um, going towards, you know, the ability to, to um, attack or defend against another group of people. Uh, one of the, it's not a, this is not a, an American example, but dynamite is a great example. Um, Nobel, Arthur Nobel, invented dynamite uh, in order to, you know, for, for demolition. Uh, and it turned out that it could be used for a bomb. And uh, so it can go both ways. You, you can invent something that's not for a military purpose. Um, the best example, maybe, for the Americans is the Wright brothers. They they invented the the air. They didn't invent the airplane. They invented the first functional airplane that they could actually fly around, which they got a patent for, and so they get the credit for inventing the airplane, which um, didn't it didn't really catch on a whole lot until World War One when they used them for scouting and then they used them to shoot at each other and then they mounted guns on the front and then they started chasing each other and then by World War II you've got gigantic airplanes dropping bombs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so it can go from you know the civilian purpose and the social purpose and the economic purpose to the military one or it can be developed by the military and then be applied um, to the society afterwards. So these are the five things that I've chosen, there are others. These are the five main points that I want you to know um, that are fundamental to Americanization. Whether it's domestic or, or international, it doesn't matter. But essentially, 
throughout the American century, as the, the prestige and the power and, and the influence of America is growing, um, these are the things that are part of American culture that end up being spread and, and they don't, I mean, everybody has their version of it, but the, the original, uh, the, the fundamental idea of all of these things really developed in America first, and then w they were adopted in various ways by other countries. And I'm not saying that the Germans and the Italians and the French didn't have communication technology, it's just that it was the Americans who brought this sort of uh, obsession almost with technology and communication and this this um, this uh, sort of dedication is a good word for it um, dedication to democracy and capitalism uh, like these these are very very important to Americans they they feel like if if we lost one of these things we wouldn't be American anymore whereas in a German uh, state or an Italian state might become socialist or communist, but an, an American person would have, have trouble imagining an America that wasn't all of these things. So these are fundamental to the understanding of American culture in the American century, the 20th century. Okay, that's it. I tried my best to do that quickly. And like I said, uh, there'll be a short list for studying. And um, I think these lectures will get shorter and more manageable for the next couple weeks. And then we have an exam review, and we have the final. And that's the end of the term. So thank you for listening, as usual, and have a good weekend. Good night.